uh, from companies that are outside the top tier of defense contractors, the big names that everyone uh, has heard of, uh, and that tend to, we think, uh, dominate the dialogue occasionally. Uh, and so the discussion of what's happening in defense industry and the issues involved in defense industry uh, often focus on the issues that are relevant to the big prime contractors, but there's a lot more that's out there that's happening in defense uh, that we think uh, is pretty critical uh, to the discussion. A lot of this perspective was sort of exemplified by the uh, defense industrial base review that the administration undertook, uh, I guess now two years ago, uh, in which they identified a number of issues happening in the industrial base, most of which uh, the problems, at least, that they were focused on and highlighted were not in the top tier of contractors, but were in the supply chain. Um, but in addition, there's really interesting issues happening at the level of the first tier subcontractors, uh, companies that are primes but aren't uh, necessarily as big as the big uh, companies. And interestingly, and something that I think we'll hear more about today, companies that really integrate services and hardware to provide solutions uh, to defense problems. Uh, in addition, and so that the focus is not just on delivering hardware or is not primarily on delivering hardware, but is really about delivering an integrated solution uh, that can be sustained and implemented over time. So I'm very excited that today we have joining us Jim Scanlon, who is the Executive Vice President and General Manager uh, of the Defense Systems Group at SAIC. Uh, and so Jim has been uh, with SAIC for some time. Uh, it, it led uh, their Army business for a number of years, uh, about a $1 billion annual portfolio that he led at that time. Uh, and prior to leading the Army business, he was the general manager for the services and solutions sector, uh, which uh, at that time within SAIC uh, had about 13,000 employees uh, and was uh, critical to kind of doing this marriage, as I said, of services uh, and uh, delivering solutions to their customers. And he played a key role in the effort uh, when SAIC divided between SAIC and, and Lidos uh, in kind of going through the process of identifying what parts of the company were going to be on which side uh, of the new businesses going forward and, and the logic uh, behind those decisions. So we're very excited to have Jim here today. Uh, and I will say our, some of you have been to some of our Main Street Defense Series uh, uh, events before. We had uh, uh, a previous one this fall. Uh, the, this is a series that we run. It is supported by the members of CSIS. Uh, and individual events are not individually sponsored, but they are supported by our membership, and we're very glad that SIC is one of those members' companies. So without further introduction from me, uh, I'm going to call Jim Scanlon uh, to the podium to give some initial thoughts. But before I do that, actually, I need to give our, our security uh, announcement that everyone knows and loves, which is to tell you that uh, we have thought through what to do if uh, there were to be an event, uh, something that would happen during today's event that would cause us to need to leave. And if that happens, I'll tell you what to do and where to go. Uh, but we don't expect that. So Jim, please, the podium's yours. Well, appreciate you all being here. Thank you, Andrew, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, thank to CSIS for SAIC to have the opportunity to come in and tell you about the things we do. I just, uh, probably to help with the context of the uh, discussion, uh, I get, can give you a brief kind of overview of what SAIC does for those that may not be uh, familiar. Uh, so SAIC, we're about a six and a half billion dollar uh, government services integrator. Uh, uh, the we do work along three kind of primary areas. I lead the Defense Systems Group, and that's the work that we do for the DOD and the Defense Logistics Agency. Uh, we have a national security group that does work with uh, the intel agencies uh, uh, and the Air Force on the space side, as well as the civilian. Uh, we have a civilian group that leads for all the civilian, fed civilian agencies. When you look at our portfolio, uh, it breaks out into three primary areas. Uh, we do technical and engineering services, as Andrew said. Uh, that's the aspect where we're doing rapid prototyping, modeling and simulation, system engineering, you know, elements where we're working hand in hand with our customers. 70% of our workforce sits side by side in our customers, and you're solving those problems uh, in laboratories, simulators, emulators, those kind of activities. And we do that uh, primarily at all of the uh, Navy Warfare Centers and as well as the research development centers within the Army. 
the other aspect is enterprise IT, and we do that across the gamut, if you will, of, of agile software development, end user services, cloud migration, cloud support kind of take uh, capabilities, the end-to-end -end, uh, network management. We do that for many of our customers. Uh, and finally, the last is supply chain management, and so we, we started to talk about that. You know, so SAIC is one of the largest uh, suppliers for DLA in terms of commodity delivery of services. We do about $700 million worth of annual business uh, in just looking at the supply chain, managing the supply chain, and supporting all of the uh, elements. And so, I mean, that kind of gives you a brief summary of, of SAIC. I've been fortunate enough, I've been there for 30 years, uh, joined out of the Air Force, uh, have seen different aspects of the company, uh, I've had a great opportunity to support our warfighters uh, for those 30 years, and look forward for the opportunity to talk further about some of the things we do. Jim. Oh. <laughs> Switch over to the uh, lavalier mics. Okay. So, thank you very much for that uh, brief introduction. And you know, one of the things that's intriguing to me about SAIC as a company, and we see this with some other companies, although I would say SAIC is notable in this respect, that um, you know, SAIC is not the company that has big factories mm -hmm. uh, uh, dotted across the country that is constantly looking to see how can we keep these production lines running. Uh, you know, we've invested decades in producing you know, a big system over time, and you know, job one in some cases can be for business development type, certainly. How do we keep the production line going? How do we keep all these folks uh, working uh, at these facilities? Rather, it seems SAIC tends to focus on finding solutions that are out there in the marketplace and applying those solutions. A lot of times it may be commercial technology, to the defense mission. Uh, and that seems to me like it must be radically different for how you, you know, uh, approach forecasting where the market is going to be, where opportunities might be, and, and what opportunities you may, have, uh, you may have to get into business, right. maybe even in areas that you haven't historically been in the past. So how does it look like from your seat, uh, thinking about it in that way? Uh, I mean, to, to what you said, I mean, uh, so, SAIC, we don't make anything at all. Uh, you know, what we have is a lot of folks uh, with, uh, you know, they have worn the uniform, they have tremendous mission understanding, mission insight, uh, and, and, and looking at, uh, you know, you take national defense strategy, you look at the things in terms of where our military is wanting to go, where our customers are wanting to go across, across the entire company. Uh, and trying to anticipate, as you said, you know, this starts back with Dr. Beister when he founded the company. It was, you know, our focus was on solving the problem, right? So I'm not going to worry about who makes what. I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at niche firms. I'm going to look across the globe. I'm going to evaluate technologies. My focus is going to be on the solving of the problem and bringing the best solution forward. There's no benefit to us in terms of where we get the product, who makes it, that those companies are in that line, they do that. Uh, and so it's, it's having that understanding of the customer, staying focused around the mission, but having the domain expertise that you can evaluate and look at those alternatives, putting them into the, the proper context. That's kind of been our mainstay where we've been playing uh, for the history of the company, and we see that as a valuable uh, piece between our customers and the original, pro uh, you know, product providers, if you will. You know, how do we take a technology and put it into an integrated solution and give it the outcome that you're looking for? Yeah. So I would imagine on that approach, relationships uh, are going to be critical. Absolutely. Uh, because, because if you're not doing a lot of this work yourself, you're, you're working with others, then that ability uh, to build relationships, to sustain relationships, Sounds like it's going to be kind of the core of what, uh, certainly as an executive, you're, you're probably doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you have it on both sides, right? And as I had mentioned, uh, you know, so 70% of the workforce sitting at our customer site. So you're in that day-to-day, -day, you know, and funny, we always joke about, you know, a lot of times people forget that they work for SAIC. They, you know, when you talk to them, I work on Project X for Captain Y, you, you know, and so, w which is very good. You, you like the focus on the mission. Uh, you know, so getting that day-to-day -day understanding where the pain points are, what the needs are, what are the things uh, that they're trying to achieve is critical. But then, conversely, when you look at industry partners, 
obviously I've got to be a trusted partner that you're willing and you know that you know that as we partner together uh, your intellectual property is protected your ability to to work together seamlessly in terms of evaluating your portfolio of capabilities to bring those forward is also important and I think SAIC I'm very proud of the reputation that we have in terms of the relationship that we have with our industry partners uh, in terms of being able to protect, work with them, allow them to grow, at the, and at the same time, us to solve the mission is really important on both sides. Yeah. Well, that's you know an interesting. You're, you're taking me to an area that we may not have pre-discussed. So my, <laughs> my apologies, and we can always okay. track if needed. No, no, no. But, you know, there's been so much discussion in recent um, recent months and years about how do we get the acquisition side of defense closer to uh, closer to mission, closer to operations, mm -hmm. and. Uh, especially if you tend to look uh, at things like software or software intensive systems, this idea of DevSecOps, mm -hmm. you know, that there's this iterative cycle between the user, in your case maybe the customer, but, right. uh, and, and the developer. Uh, and it seems like, you know, that as you've just described it, because your folks are essentially forward deployed into, mm -hmm. uh, into the offices that they're supporting, uh, that, that you, I mean, maybe you have an ability or do you see that you're able to kind of keep this tight coupling or linkage between the user and, and technology provider. Um, you know, so certainly you try to do that. I, I mean, obviously, as you look at all the services and, the, and you know, the, the challenge on modernization, readiness, and so forth, you know, there's just a fundamental need across the board based on the national defense strategy to push technology quicker yeah. and leverage all of the capabilities, how to advanced experimentation, fail fast, try fast, those kind of things. And so uh, for us, having that understanding and insight is really important to be able to do that. Um, you know, but as we've engaged with the customers and, you know, uh, and as I think about one of the challenges, I think, uh, in the acquisition process, and we were talking about it coming down here, you know, is you, you typically get, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of specification. And as contractors, if you want to go and meet the system, you got to meet all these requirements and so forth. That's a fundamental difference of of stepping back and saying, okay, what are my trying, what is the mission that I'm trying to achieve? Yeah. How can I look at those parameters from a cost schedule performance to do that trade space and have that ability? The, you know, in many cases, the acquisition hasn't gotten to that point yet. Yeah. We know how to give out specs, we know how people to bid to that, we know how to evaluate. And, and sometimes, and you know, there's noteworthy programs where you build things that they don't achieve what you're trying to do. But if you, you know, if you step back from the standpoint and say, okay, but what was the fundamental aspect, the mission side, then perhaps that technology really would have given the benefit, or I didn't need to go as fast as X, or, or shoot as far as that. And so that, that ability to think of it from the mission execution side as opposed to the technical specification side is a it's an evolution process. Some programs do it better than others. Others, uh, they, they struggle with that. Yeah, I know. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, General Hyten was here at CSIS earlier in the week and gave a talk on the requirements process. And mm -hmm. you know, he said some things that hit the press that were critical of the acquisition system. But to be fair, he also said quite a bit about how to, the requirements process needs to change pretty right. radically in his view uh, to be able to do. I think a little bit of what you are saying, which is to be able to present requirements that are clear enough that you know what needs to be done without having the rigidity of right. you know, a thousand specs, any individual one of which really isn't that vital. Yeah, and I think as you look at it, I mean, it goes to, and I'm, and I'm really interested in the whole digital transformation, right? And so just, and you, and you look at the Navy perspective, the things they're trying to do with the digital twin architecture. You know, so it fundamentally gets down to, uh, with model-based system engineering, mission engineering, that, that ability to leverage the power of the computer, the digital environment, the virtual synthetic analysis. You know, for me to be able to do those evaluations earlier, sooner, faster, to be able to make those trades and so forth, I think is really critical. And, and part of this transformation that we're seeing, this, this fourth uh, evolution, is, is enabling to do that. The technology, the things that are in place are allowing you to, to bring things, roll things forward. I mean, it's very costly to cut metal, to, to, to put someone, you know, it takes time, it costs money to bring that forward, and if it's not the solution you want, 
I mean, you see where programs get into it. But if I can do that in a model-based engineering to do those trades and evaluations and so forth, I can enhance that requirements trade-off and analysis. And, that, and that's kind of the cornerstone of what SAIC does. Yeah. It's, it's in that element of architecture analysis, trades, combinatorial uh, analysis and requirements payoff. Um, being able to look at technologies in that context is really important. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, has been interesting in the last couple of years is uh, there's a lot that SAIC does, but also, the, you know, you've had, you have had some hard, you know, some forays into mm -hmm. producing equipment uh, or bidding on producing equipment. Yes. Uh, and I know it was a AUSA back in the fall, and there was a, a pretty aggressive looking vehicle in SAIC's <laughs> display. Uh, and it's subsequently, uh, you know, there's been interest in that, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how, how has that experience been of, uh, engaging with the Pentagon, you know, because you've done this technical uh, expertise, supply chain management. Right. Like, what's it been like, you know, trying to uh, deliver something that's at more of an end item uh, and system level? Uh, I, I, well, it's, uh, well, it was disappointing in the outcome, obviously. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that uh, work other ways. But, uh, you know, as you go through that, one of the things um, people not aware, uh, uh, Andrew, I think, um, so SAIC has a long history and heritage of, of doing modification on platforms. You, know, you could go back to uh, the DARPA program on uh, the uh, Combat Hybrid, Hi Hybrid Power System program. That was work that we had done partnering with BAE, investigating advanced technologies and so forth. Uh, you go back to the MRAP, all MRAP vehicles that were fielded back during the war, they came through SAIC. We did all the C4 integration, co-site mitigation, all those kind of things, working with our customer uh, in Charleston, taking those vehicles, putting them on the ship, sending them over the uh, forward operating bases and so forth. And then while in theater, we had a whole retrofit modification program where vehicles, after they came back from missions, would pull in one side of the building. We'd take that all the way back down, upgrade the transmission, power, whatever. So we've had a long history, but we've done that on the services side. Yeah. Uh, but because of that, we had to evaluate, we had to have the technologies, the processes, the tools, those kind of things. You know, and as, as, as we've been able to work closely with the customer, uh, and, and so we saw a real need, you know, the government needing to have control of its destiny, that TDP, you know, and again, uh, you know, and, and I totally appreciate and understand OEM providers in terms of investing IP and those kind of things, but making it a challenge for the government in this rapid integration, rapid modification, without that TDP, that technical data package, they're limited in what they can do. So we saw it from the standpoint that we could push that envelope, provide that information to the government, number one. Number two, a, a, an alternative to the traditional primes. You know, so using the customer relationships, using our insight, using the capabilities, we saw that as an opportunity to step out of our comfort zone. Um, but we were selective in the sense that it was not a blue, you know, not a true blueprint type programs. These were programs where you were looking at existing systems and we were going to modify by bringing technology insertion. That was, again, our sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, and so those were the ones that we focused on. Uh, unfortunately, things did not turn out uh, the way they are. We continue to do that work. We'll continue to look for opportunities. And it's, it, it, it doesn't have to be combat vehicles. It could be any platform where we may uh, look to do technology insertion, modifications, and so forth. We still see the need to do that, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, so I know, I know one of the areas that... Um has gotten a lot of focus, at least in our community, think tank community lately, is, is the Air Force's uh, effort towards um, you know, what they describe as a digital century series, yeah. which is focused on next generation fighter aircraft. I'm not gonna urge you to get into the fighter aircraft business, but <laughs> if you think about the whole approach of, you know, you talked about digital twin, right? Digital twinning, digital thread. Uh, where the Air Force, I guess, is trying to go with digital century series is towards the idea of people bringing forward prototypes and new technological approaches mm -hmm. that can be uh, explored and, if you will, validated uh, in relatively low quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if it really works, if it delivers something you want, you go into you know, a higher order production of that. Uh, and if it doesn't, you don't. And maybe you don't 
either way hold on to the stuff for a very long time. And in some sense, uh, I could see what you just described with combat vehicles, you know, maybe working in that environment. Again, I'm not saying necessarily with high, you know, yeah, high performance combat aircraft, <laughs> but with other other things that have kind of more that digital approach, where you've got a company that's really focused more on introducing technology than it is on supporting a production base. Right. Well, I, I totally agree. I, I think the challenge in that, and, and as you look at getting back again to the acquisition element, you know, the, the other aspect as we went through that, where it gets really difficult for the non-traditional, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of cases and wanting to move faster and so forth, we were seeing firm fixed price efforts, bid samples, where industry was required to make substantial investments up front to bring a capability forward. You know, and on one level, I see, you know, you want a mature capability that you're evaluating, but usually to get to the requirements, these are not things that are right off the shelf. They're off the shelf with an iteration or modification. Yeah. And so it gets very difficult for the non-traditionals to go forward in that. In, in the scenario, like you said, where if you could create that environment at certain elements that you can bring things forward in a, uh, either in a virtual environment or in, a, in, in an experimental kind of capability, uh, it would be very, uh, I think that would be very beneficial. I mean, we had the fortunate on the Army uh, as a key element on the NIE experiments. And so seeing technology coming forward, how do you integrate some of those technologies, the, the limitations and so forth, I think the, uh, the value that was gained from that and the insight uh, you know, was, was really important. So I, I could definitely see the benefit of doing something like that. So do you see the, the challenges in com incorporating commercial technology into the military acquisition system, the defense acquisition system, as something that you know, is a problem um, of execution. Uh, there's still structural barriers. You know, in theory, in the 1990s, you know, the department formally embraced commercial technology, established a preference for commercial technology, uh, and, uh, and there are meaningful ways in which we see a lot of commercial technology in the defense world. I mean, a lot of the parts, a lot of supply chain, you know, when you go two or three tiers down, there is not a difference between a commercial mm -hmm. supply chain, mm -hmm. defense supply chain, some, parts of the market, you go to their factory and it's the same factory. Right. Uh, but having said that, you know, you don't, there is this distinction, right? There is a separation right. to some extent between defense industry and the commercial marketplace. And so, uh, and, and the, the 809 panel came out a few years ago, uh, was trying to come up with ways to kind of break down, if you will, the, the final barriers uh, to really embracing commercial tech. How do you see it from, from the way you, go, you do business? Uh, did you see big barriers to commercial technology? Is this something that SAIC's mastered? Um, what do you think? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we've mastered it. I think we have, we have a very good experience in partnering with uh, commercial firms. I mean, you take from the combat, uh, you know, I, I, I would call like an STK, which was a tremendous partner of our, but they had not dealt with the, the DOD, uh, if you will. Uh, we're working with Polaris on the uh, infantry squad vehicle. I, you know, I, I, it depends on the level of, are you talking a s component, subsystem, system, and so forth in terms of the complexity. Certainly in the, uh, the uh, uh, we have, uh, again, as, as we talked about the partnership, you know, understanding how DOD executes the systems, the, the cyber, the systems, and so forth. We have that experience. We understand how to do that. And so uh, we ha uh, we're a good partner to commercial entities and trying to bring those technologies uh, forward. There's certainly, uh, I mean, at the, the rapid pace of technology evolution, you have to look at some of those technologies. Yeah, I mean, there, you have to look at it, and certainly, uh, you have to look at it as you as you go from the uh, both the engineering side to the enterprise IT. I mean, the ability to infuse those technologies in that environment much easier, much faster. And so, um, I, I think we're seeing more and more of commercial companies enter into the space, uh, depending upon what you're. You know, the barriers are different depending upon what you're trying to do, mm. uh, and, and I, I I can only see that getting. Uh, that accelerating more and more just because the pace of technology and things that are happening outside of the DOD and being able to leverage that for some of the what uh, NDS and some of the other things are trying to do. Where do you think it works particularly well or, or particularly not well in the system today? <laughs> 
Well, I, you know, I, I think within the IT side, it works very well. Uh, you know, when you think about from software development, you think about agile, the, the, the capabilities, the functionality and so forth, it's really easier to translate. And so I, I think you see that. I think within uh, much of the engineering side, you know, at one point it used to be, uh, you know, if, if you hit all these mil specs, then you can bring this technology in. But when you look at, uh, you know, uh, the customer has been smarter in terms of, okay, which one of those really matter? Where can I relax? What is that trade space? Do I really need minus 30 degrees C? Can I take, you know, so you get the ability to look at some of those technologies, certainly in a lot of cases, on the platform side, when you get to suspension and the power systems and auxiliaries and controls, there's a lot of technology that has applicability. And so more and more, I, I believe the OEMs, you know, when you really look at their supply chain, it is, it is leveraging that uh, in a much greater perspective. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how you have folks, you know, forward deployed, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. next to the government customer. Um, that seems like it present a a few challenges, uh, you know, obviously management challenges, but I really want to focus on uh, talent management and how do you recruit the right people who are going to be able to fit into that, that environment where yeah. your customer is, and, but also have the expertise, because uh, that's presumably why you know, customers going to SAIC is they're usually looking for pretty high-end expertise. So what's it like to manage the, to do the talent management required uh, in, in that scenario? Uh, I mean, it's a challenge across the entire sector. I mean, uh, our customers, I, I mean, across the board talent. Uh, in the advanced technology, you know, when you start looking at it, cyber and data analytics and AI and hypersonics, where the technology, it's those individuals are at a premium, so we're all competing for that uh, aspect. I mean, certainly for us, one of the key elements that we leverage are, are folks that have worn the uniform. That have you know as they transition out, uh, it's uh, you know they have the most closest understanding in terms of where the needs are, where the pain points, um, and through things that we may be able to do from advanced training and advanced learning, give them those certifications and so forth that they may need. Uh, working closely with industry at the, you know excuse me with um, universities, uh, there's a lot of relationships that we have in terms of trying to get further down into the stream in terms of uh, identifying talent early, looking for relationships, you know, that as quickly they come out, uh, that you have a job and, uh, you know, uh, that guarantee, if you will. Uh, um, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is a challenge across the board and it gets, uh, it gets exaggerated by, you know, things like how long it takes to get clearances and those things that you're, yeah. you're aware of. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's, you know, SAIC at large, uh, you know, I, I believe that we've done a very good job in terms of trying to put together uh, a, a, a balanced, competitive uh, environment, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what we offer, the things that you, uh, you can uh, take advantage of, the, the benefits, all those kind of things to, uh, to try and draw that talent forward that we need in the areas in order to execute uh, for the customers. Yeah. Uh, you touched on uh, you know, kind of firm fixed price and the business environment, what I tend to call the business model mm -hmm. uh, under which, you know, the government's trying to engage with technology providers. And sometimes that business model is friendly and sometimes it may be a little less friendly. Um, you know, it's, it's a term we don't hear a lot anymore. It's not in vogue, the Better Buying Power Initiative, which mm -hmm. was uh, the hot thing when I was in the government, but it's not so much anymore. But, you know, there was a big push there to kind of reassess the terms of trade, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had effects, um, some, some that were intended, some that may have been unintended. But, right. but what do you see as where, particularly on the services side, because there was a big focus on services and, right. and better buying power, uh, are, we, you know, are we still engaged in kind of the perspective of betting buyer power, which was to some extent a creature of a, a defense drawdown, which is no longer the environment that we live in, right. although budgets are flattening out again, I would point out. Right. But, uh, you know, do you see that the, the mindset of, you know, kind of trying to squeeze uh, perhaps the industry side of the equation for more productivity, is that still where the focus is or or, or is the contracts kind of moved on and, and away from that model? No, I, I, I think you still see that. I think we're, the evolution that we kind of, you know, in, in that whole better buying power, there was a there was a large pendulum swing in the services side to LPTA, lo low price technically acceptable. 
the, the challenge in that kind of environment is, you know, when you think about it and the way uh, it, it was set up, is I've got a very defined scope. I know exactly what I'm doing and so forth. And, and price is the factor that determines. You know, in, in many of the instances on, on the services side, when you think about the partnership at the kind of things that we're doing from a, uh, you know, the knowledge-based kind of activity. I've got this problem. I'm not really quite sure how I want to address that problem. LPTA is not necessarily the right approach. Uh, and the challenge you get uh, as we compete in that space, you, you know, uh, folks that perhaps don't have the credentials, that have, don't have the proper experience or whatnot, but are willing to, to dive for price win those activities. You know, unfortunately, the customer may not see that until six months, 12 months in it, and so forth. You're starting to see that come back uh, further to where that quality, that understanding, that trade space, that more of the best value is there. Certainly cost is, is a critical element, but looking at the other dimensions are, are uh, more important in that space. You, you know, obviously, we don't have as much experience on the solution development side, uh, but you know, the challenge that we see in those, those firm fixed price elements in an EMD program, where you're still doing requirements trades, you're still trying to you know, figure out uh, through ad advanced learning and, and so forth, you know, I, I would question in, in those kind of cases whether firm fixed price is always the right uh, opportunity because obviously, you know, businesses have to make the trade space. You have to, you have to execute the cost. You have to deliver, you know, per, you have to deliver a profit to your shareholders and so forth. And that becomes an added uh, challenge if you're trying to rapidly push technology and solutions forward. And so, you know, within that trade space, uh, just understanding that uh, the challenges, the, the, the structure, if you will, and for us, picking which ones are best appropriate to our business model is what we try and do now. Yeah. Is it your sense that the government has improved in its ability to distinguish value? In other words, you know, kind of key to doing a best value approach, not, not just basing it on price, is being able to accurately discriminate between the, the higher end, better value providers and those who may talk a good game, but may not be able to actually deliver uh, as advanced a capability as, as their competitors. And, and, you know, I mean, I think part of what led to better buying power was mm -hmm. the sense that the government, you know, may have been paying for advanced capability and not necessarily always doing a good job of picking right. the folks who had that to offer. So is it your sense that, um, that we have come a ways in the last several years doing a better job of defining what value is required and, and recognizing it when we see it? I, I do believe you're seeing that and in a lot of cases across all the spectrum. It's, it's that earlier engagement with industry at the early part where you're, you're you know, talking about here's the things I'm trying to do, here's the kind of specification requirements, what's the art of the possible and so forth. That has, uh, I, I think that has, uh, made it clear to both sides in terms of what the intent, what we're trying, you know, both sides are trying to achieve. I think, I think you are seeing that then as it rolls forward into solicitations and uh, uh, that, that better uh, ability to distinguish, you know, the things that are really important, what makes sense. Uh, and so so it, it has improved uh, with, the, uh, with the delivery of better buying power. Great, well, that's good to hear. <laughs> that's key, it's definitely needed. Um, well, during your, your intro, you did sort of wave the red, the red flag in front of the bull here because you talked about uh, supply chain management oh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and also IT. So one of the hottest issues I think in, the, in industry right now is the issue of the uh, cyber security maturity model certification. Oh, yes. you know, the effort by DOD to um, set uh, reasonable criteria from its perspective, reasonable criteria for its supply chain to, to be able to meet to address the cybersecurity threat. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, you know, has huge impacts for industry on its IT systems and potentially big impacts on the supply chain that depending on uh, how effectively the rollout happens, how people are able to get certified or not certified. Right. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you see that playing out? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, so we're right in the middle of that as you go through the NIST first and and some of these uh, uh, rollouts and and uh, 
Yeah, there's been challenges, obviously, because part of the portfolio that we have and some of the programs, uh, you know, it's the ability for government employees at a location to go online, uh, basically order parts and, and work, uh, work that. And then you start talking about multi-factor authentication and those kind of activities. Well, how do you now insert that into a system where we're responsible for our network and, and what information goes in and out, but yet we've got all of the folks that are trying to engage. And so how do you change that business model? How do you do that? And so we're working through those. Um, We'll get there, uh, and I, I think that's all doable. Certainly in the broader perspective, you know, uh, and we're engaged with, uh, you know, uh, partners to look at things like blockchain technologies, think about smart contracts, and how do, how do we leverage and use some of those technologies focused on where they're trying to go uh, that will meet, uh, you know, the, will meet the requirements, the needs, uh, but we can, again, leverage things as, as they emerge so that you're not just looking at about bin management and, and uh, you know, those kind of things and just uh, consumables, if you will, but really leveraging technology in the way that will enable you to have a secure supply chain, know where things are at every point of the uh, uh, control from a cyber perspective and so forth. That uh, um, the things, it, it, it's not there yet, uh, I mean, but, but leveraging that technology is, is areas that we're focused on uh, and working with customers uh, across the uh, spectrum. And is there, uh, I, I guess, are the criteria that, that's been discussed for uh, UnderNIST and for CMMC, is it, is it enough? Uh, you know, I, someone <laughs> who I see as highly knowledgeable of the system mentioned to me at one point that like 80% now of the purchases that DLA makes are automated purchases. In other words, it's not a human contracting officer who's saying, here's the purchase order. It is an automated system that says, all right, the bin is empty. <laughs> Right. Uh, the order goes out. Uh, and so, you know, if it's, if it's an automated system, if it's the computer doing it, uh, you know, I don't know if you apply two-factor authentication to a computer or not, but, it, you know, it may not be as meaningful as it is as a security measure for humans. Right. So do, are we on the right track? Are we covering our bases? I think we're on the right track. I think, it, you know, and like I said, we, we do have, we have contracts where there is a person in the loop enter, entering that. There are other cases where, as you say, it's a, you know, uh, using uh, RTF technology and so forth, looking where you get automatic resupply and so forth. Uh, uh, I, I think just generally looking at the source uh, all the way back to where parts are made, all, that supply chain, just understanding that, you know, uh, with electronics and counterfeiting and so forth. I, I think the intention of CMMC and the NIST, I, I think those are all in the right direction. Those are things that we need to collectively do. I mean, uh, you know, one could quickly start looking at and, and, and you could wrap your head around the, you know, the cyber and, and, and the threat and so forth very quickly. And so I think it's all in the right direction. It's just how quickly we can implement those things, how quickly we can change processes uh, and bring those uh, technologies into the things that we're doing. Uh, let me talk a little bit about um, multi-domain operations because, you know, the focus now is on uh, trying to move away. You know, we talked about moving away from traditional requirements uh, and and multi-domain means moving away from traditional understandings of the way the services operate, the way they interact with one another, moving to a level of integration, you know, beyond joint to, mm -hmm. you know, truly uh, being somewhat agnostic about who's delivering capability right. uh, in any given, you know, within a scenario. Uh, that's, you know, that's no small intellectual <laughs> undertaking. Uh, how do you see what SAIC does playing into the push towards multi-domain? Uh, I, you know, I, I fundamentally see SAIC as a key player in, in that space and have for many years. I mean, uh, what we do with our Navy customers, as I talked about, the, the digital twin type activities, uh, littoral uh, element doing some cyber architecture kind of work. You go back to the future combat system, doing that system of system kind of element. And so that, that system engineering, that, that integrated system of system architecture, that is, the, that is the place that we play. And so when you think of multi-domain operation, it is a system of systems architecture uh, uh, that you just pull mission threads all the way through. And so that ability to bring those together, that understanding about how 
how technologies connect, how they interact, what are the limitations and so forth. Um, it, 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 it plays especially well to us uh, because of the domain understanding, but not limited because we don't make anything. So yeah. I, I, it's, it's purely the architecture and the output as opposed to thinking of it from a standpoint of a particular capability, technology, or product. Um, and I, I assume you're tracking what the Air Force is talking about, among the other services, but this sort of, uh, it's a terrible acronym, I think, but JADC2, you know, the, the efforts towards trying to put some systemic framework around uh, the sharing of information across different kinds of domain operations. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. My, my partner, Michael LaRouche, uh, who leads our Air Force work, certainly yeah. taking those same kind of capabilities there. But, but even you know, for the work that uh, we're doing uh, with the Army, trying to understand where POC3T is trying to go, just that whole uh, expeditious mission command capability, uh, you know, as it fits in that context, again, in the, the use and employing uh, the technologies uh, yeah, it's, it's something that we, we focus on, we track, uh, we try and look for those opportunities where we can continue to engage in, and add value to that, uh, to that overall problem. I've got one more question on my list and then maybe I'll turn sure. to, our, to our audience folks uh, who've been waiting patiently, but um, it's on, on international partnering. Mm -hmm. We talked about the criticality yep. of partnerships and the, the way SAIC does business. And one thing that's notable is you've also, you haven't limited yourself to just companies in the U.S., you've also done some international partnerships. And so I guess the question is, how, how has that gone? How has that worked? How workable has it been? And then do you, do you see it as an area uh, you know, that's likely to grow in the future? Uh, or is it something that only has a certain size role? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, from an I international business, that's not, uh, SAIC doesn't have a lot in that area. I mean, obviously, if you're going to really think about it and do that very well, you need a, you need a presence, you need a sign. But, uh, but, we, but we have had experience working with international partners. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. You've got, the, you've got the very simple things from a language perspective and a cultural perspective, and you have to work through those. Uh, there's a lot of cases in terms of, you know, uh, technologies that were developed uh, in, in, an, in, a, in another uh, country, which is very valuable to them, uh, and how much, how protected that is, and how much information they're willing to share with the U.S. government. There's challenges from that perspective. There's also uh, the challenge from the U.S. side of, well, those things, uh, you know, they might have been demonstrated to a stig or they've been tested uh, elsewhere, but they haven't been tested to our standards. And so there's a lot of different things that you have to work your way through in all of those. I think as you just look at, again, with the pace of technology, with, uh, I mean, we have a global, you know, it's a global environment. And, and at, at, at its core, you know, suspension system, power system, the, it, it, they're international providers across the board. So collectively, we all need to figure out how to leverage that, how to use that. I think the OEMs, they do it, you know, obviously, they have a lot of experience. They do it very well. For us as a services company where we were, uh, walking into a new area. It was a learning experience, but it was a very, I think it was very positive. The ones that, uh, you know, we had the opportunity to work with Crossbow Phi, Ryan Mattel, uh, SDK, those were all very good. And I, I, but I believe it was because of SEIC and the way we treated them, respected them, and uh, de uh, developed that professional rapport where both sides felt trusted uh, and respected, and it made it easier for, for us to engage at the level that we needed to do to move forward. Great. Well, I want to take a pause here at this point on my questions and open up to audience questions. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We'll have someone bring a mic, ask you to introduce yourself, and, and ask your question. So hands, hands up if you have a question to ask. Greg Sanders, CSAS. So on the contract models for non-traditionals, mm -hmm. um, the reticence to use firm fixed price or anything development, I think, is pretty well established. And you know, you've talked about some of the challenges. But there are also some non-traditionals that are hesitant to move away from firm fixed price because they don't want to get into cost accounting. Yep. And I wonder how you kind of balance those two. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, so in those OTA where you talk about the non-traditional partners and so forth, where we tend to work with the, the, those become, like I said, uh, you know, on the uh, infantry squad vehicle, Polaris, a very well-respected firm in the commercial developing off-road vehicles, uh, they did not have as much experience working with the government. So in that relationship where we could take, we'll take our understanding, our systems, our procedures and so forth, uh, on top of the system engineering type of things that we do, marry it with their experience, it becomes a very good partnership in, in that scenario. And so, uh, all, you know, we, we have a lot of OTA vehicles that we deliver capability. We bring a lot of non-traditionals, but it's in that working relationship where we have our ability to manage and not burden them with, uh, you know, some of those requirements. We'll take that risk on, we'll take those opportunities on and allow them to stay within the space that they're very good at. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. You're welcome. Um, Marjorie Sensor with Inside yeah. Defense. Uh, one of the areas I know that you um, and Nazi Keen are spending a lot of time is on talent. I wondered mm -hmm. if you're seeing any changes in the security clearance process, if things are moving any faster, any progress on the backlog from where you sit? Uh, it, it has, certainly over the last year, it has, it has gotten uh, a lot better. Uh, I mean, the time at which, you know, there was a case where we would, we would find the person, we'd have them, uh, we knew exactly what we needed to bring for a cloud, you work through it. And in those real tough talent areas, if you're not within a few weeks kind of deal, they're on to the next opportunity many, many times on the commercial side. Um, and, and so that was very frustrating because you couldn't move that forward. We have seen where that, that timeline, where it was 60, 70, 80 days getting now to a more reasonable. Is it where it needs to be? No, uh, but it, it's certainly uh, substantially better than where it has. So the trend is right. I think as they continue to think about how they could solve that problem differently, uh, you know, from a, you know, uh, and, and you see thir certain aspects, again, in the, digital element, do we move it to an events activity and using the technology as opposed to the more traditional? Can we speed that process up even better? Uh, I, I think everyone recognizes uh, the problem. And again, we're all fighting for that same talent. So uh, we, we've got to continue to move that forward. I'm going to throw another one from my end here because you mentioned OTAs. Yes. Uh, which is one of my uh, current areas of interest, let's put it that way. Uh, and I'll give you a preview. This may be a long question, so apologies. But, uh, you know, we've, we've been tracking the growth of OTAs, and over the last several years that growth has been uh, robust, uh, even to the point where uh, now the total obligations under OTAs may be in excess of everything the department has expended on traditional weapon system engineering manufacturing development, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. six five RD T and E type right. activity. So, you know, OTAs appear to have grown to the point where the uh, the alternate lane uh, is bigger than the main lane, or at least as big. Right. Um, what's been your experience working on these OTAs? Uh, do they truly provide you know the less bureaucratic, more streamlined approach? Does that more streamlined approach ultimately enable uh, you as a technology provider, solutions provider, to provide better solutions more effectively? Or, or do you find that, okay, it's a great vehicle, we're getting business under it. For our purposes, maybe, maybe it's not that different. What's been the experience? Yeah, the experience has been very positive. Uh, you know, uh, for the type of work that we do in, in terms of the speed, the ability to bring and engage folks outside, uh, um, that, that flexibility has, has its intended consequence. Uh, we've been able to work through that. Uh, as you said, uh, a, a reduction of some of the regulations and so forth gives you that flexibility to kind of focus on the things, the trades that you're trying to do. So it's, it's been very good, uh, but we've predominantly been in the S&T, R&D kind of uh, aspect, which I think you know, was the core as, uh, area that, that concentrates. Uh, you know, the challenge that you have from the OTA is that 30% uh, cost share non-traditional partner, uh, you know, in that either you're bringing someone in or then looking through the cost share. You know, so 
in the services environment where you, when you look at it and the, the business model, the fee kind of deal, the cost sharing is, is much more challenging. Mm. So, uh, you know, in the use of the OTA, it does force you to look at those non-traditional partners uh, and it, to bring and pull technology forward. So for, from that aspect, uh, certainly I think it, it, it gives you the uh, additional added benefit. And I think if I'm not mistaken, there was an, a move to allow DOD to waive the cost share in they certain instances, yeah, and yes. maybe maybe SEIC will <laughs> <laughs> will experiment with that. Uh, there you go. Uh, Do you find yourself experiencing much pushback from the customer with this constantly evolving? And um, like, are they adapting well to it, or is there pushback from a more non-traditional partnership and industry partnerships that you're integrating? No, I don't. I, I, you don't. Uh, we don't see the pushback uh, because, you know, from their perspective, it's looking at, okay, here's the, here's the system that I'm looking for, here's the outcome. So they're leaving it to us as the prime in whatever instance, whether it's delivering a solution through the service side or whether we're uh, the other. I mean, it, they're just holding us responsible uh, as long as that capability meets the, the needs that they're looking for. Um, it's our responsibility uh, to ensure that it can integrate in the overall program and so forth. So, no, I, not, not seeing that pushback at all. In, in fact, you see the, the contrary, uh, excitement about looking outside the, not, you know, the typical uh, approach. This is not fair. She asked some questions. <laughs> on the but Andrew got so many. Um, I just have one more about the acquisition landscape. You know, we're seeing the first kind of deal out of the Raytheon UTC antitrust. There's still L3 Harris divestitures likely. Lido's picking up Dynetics. It seems like a pretty um, busy marketplace. I wonder what your thoughts are on SAIC's potential role. Uh, we're certainly monitoring and tracking all that as the landscape is changing very quickly, obviously, uh, you know, in terms of new uh, competitors in the space and where they're trying to work their way through that. Uh, you know, certainly SAIC continuously looks at the, the, the environment, uh, evaluates opportunities where it makes best sense, uh, and, and will continue to do that. Certainly Nozick uh, in her role is has, has challenged us all to kind of continue to do what we've done and, and, and pushing us uh, uh, to, to continue to drive the company forward. And so that will be something that we'll continue to look at in the portfolio, both from an organic and inorganic perspective. Uh, and let me ask, I, I think a related question on that, which is, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's been a little less focus, I think, on, on the services side in the last few years. People's focused on OTA. If you include R&D in services, then, then yes, there's been uh, still quite a bit of focus on that, especially with the stand-up of the USD R&E. Mm -hmm. But on more of the traditional you know, services, technical services side, uh, I think there just hasn't, to my perception, hasn't been quite as much focus on that in the last couple of years. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing from your perspective? Would you, would you hope to have maybe more engagement from senior department leadership on issues unique to being a services contractor, or is it better when the eye of Sauron is elsewhere? <laughs> uh, uh, there are certainly venues and opportunities for engagement that, that one can bring those challenges forward. Uh, um, I mean, I think there, as we talked about, clearances, those, uh, you know, uh, some of those persistent problems that we've had uh, that, that continue to engage. Uh, I, I would say less focus is probably better right now. It allows us to continue to work closely with the customers, do the things that they need to do. Uh, and as long as we, uh, we all stay within the, uh, the compliance of the regulations, uh, it gives us that flexibility. But certainly things that are larger than that, uh, all of us within, uh, you know, our, our, our peers within the space, they, we've, we've got those avenues that we can engage and, and certainly bring those forward. All right, and I, you also made reference to, um, again, closeness with the customer. Uh, and I know your background, having kind of run the whole Army business, um, your Army customer is changing. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we have Army Futures Command, uh, a dramatic re-wickering, a reworking of how the Army approaches, thinking about modernization, how it does trade-offs. Uh, 
yep. uh, uh, on the capability side. So how does that, what does that look like from an SAIC perspective, the stand-up of Army Futures Command and how it may or may not change how you interact with your customer? Uh, I mean, it's certainly, uh, it, it is a dynamic changing environment, uh, you know, at the, you know, as I said at the beginning, at the, uh, um, you know, at the, C at, at the RDE comm level, at the labs, and in, uh, you know that that engagement and so forth is staying the same. That that's not changing. Uh, where you're seeing, as you said, the Army Futures Command, the CFT, those those type of activities in terms of the prioritization, you are seeing that. You know, the Night Court activity did a reprioritization a lot of the program of record activities, which, from our standpoint, uh, you know, as we're performing the support, the the solutioning through services, we've got the flexibility of the capability to, you know, as the priority change, we just continue to refocus and engage, uh, still doing the same kind of activity. Um, but certainly even uh, we're working and supporting AFC as they're trying to stand up their system engineering activities, trying to, uh, you know, build that infrastructure now to, to do the things uh, that uh, they need to be able to do in order to manage that portfolio and prioritization going forward. Uh, and so it's, it is an opportunity for us to take the capabilities, the things that we've already been doing, uh, and, and, and bring those forward to try and, uh, again, help them solve their most pressing need. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. Yeah, well, and I hear you, you say it's dynamic, right? Which yes, means absolutely. I would read into that maybe too much, <laughs> but you're you know, developing. Mm -hmm. uh, but earlier you had referenced future combat system. And you know, one of the central challenges there was, uh, was the engagement between the Army and industry on the decision making that was happening about priority setting, about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see an emerging structure within Army Futures Command that can kind of do that which maybe didn't always work? <laughs> yeah. and future combat system. Well, I mean, I think what you've got, you know, at the Futures Command, the, the capabilities development under General Wesley, looking at the futures, the architecture, all those aspects. You got the CFTs that are taking those fundamental core elements, if you will, and 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 that, you know, as a uh, the the three levels of the TRADOC, the PEO, and the, and the CFT, if you will, you know across the board really seeing a tight connection between those two so you're trying to get the acquisition the requirements and the development side all together uh, and, and you know certainly it was a major undertaking for the army uh, in going through it but uh, you know you, it, you continue to see uh, how that's evolving the goodness that's coming out of that and, and certainly across the board SAIC is engaged in all of those CFTs at different levels and so uh, um, you know, we'll continue to work with the customer and, uh, again, stay focused on the mission. Right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted You're to welcome. have you with us. And uh, we will remain in touch, uh, the audience here in person and online, about future events in this uh, Main Street Defense series. Keep your eyes peeled. Uh, but please join me in uh, thanking Jim for his time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.